people of Earth. We have come to upgrade your cosmic consciousness. DNA activation ready in three, two, one. Hi, welcome to Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. I'm Craig Anderson. And I'm Lou Quinto. Lou, guess what we're going to do today? <laughs> what will we do today? We're going to let's we see, gonna do a podcast. <laughs> we're going to do a podcast. Yes. Okay. A Thank plus. you, Mr. Obvious. <laughs> we are going to make you smarter about something new today. That's oh, I like that. Make you smarter. That's what we do here. This whole podcast is nothing but an opportunity for Lou to learn. 100 and something <laughs> episodes in. And now we yeah. finally told the truth, Lou. Yeah. There it is. So today we are talking about ESG. Do you know what that stands for, Lou? Yes, I did my what homework. Environment, right. social, and governance. There you go. We're going to talk about what that means and why that's important to investors, to companies, to small business owners. So we have invited... Dora Lutz. She is the author of The Aspirational Business. She's the founder of Giving Spring and the creator of the course Business Planning for Social Entrepreneurs at Purdue University, just up the street, Lou, and your alma mater. My alma mater. Hail Purdue. Someday we got to get a gator on here to talk about stuff, and that will be my next plan. But <laughs> I'm excited to have Dora on. She works with businesses to educate leadership on the potential benefits of ESG, help them build meaningful strategies and drive execution across the organization. So I've seen her speak several times. I'm super excited that we got her on. Uh, so let's go to the interview with Dora Lutz. Dora, welcome to Q&A on Breakthrough Leadership. We're so glad you could join us today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Well, we, uh, you know, Lou and I, as I told you earlier, we know enough about today's topic to be a little dangerous, but that means we'll ask some decent questions and probably a few bad ones. But before <laughs> we dive into our topic today, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about uh, your background and where you are and, and some of the things you have going on? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Uh, really, the, the shortest way to say it is that I am just really passionate about the way businesses can create positive impact in the world. I think there are an incredible amount of talented people in the business world who have good hearts and want to make the world a better place, and they're in positions to do so, we just need to figure out how we leverage, leverage our businesses to be able to do that. So I've done a lot of research on what this topic looks like, how high functioning organizations actually do create positive impact. Um, and I work with a lot of organizations to help them build the strategies and execute them so that their people are enabled to take this work into the world. Oh, that's great. That's, you know, I had a business that I ran before we started doing this, that it was very focused on helping people and, and helping employees. And so that's why I'm so excited to have this topic for us to cover today, because I really do think when we do it the right way, we can actually have an impact on lives. So I'm going to turn it over to Lou for the first question. And we'll just dive right in. So okay. Lou, why don't you kick us off? All yeah. right. <laughs> Look, Dora gets all ready there. Go ahead. I'm, re I'm ready for you. I do. I love this. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dora, Tell me, I, I, I know nothing about ESG metrics, okay? I know it stands for environmental, social, and governmental metrics. Uh, that, that's, it, these are, I would equate them for our viewers and listeners as some key performance indicators, new ones, because they haven't been around very, very long. Uh, and if they've had, they, they, they weren't on a, on a massive scale uh, where it becomes common knowledge, it was maybe one company did it, the other company, because you got to remember, I'm old enough, particularly when we get to that environmental message, uh, I'm old enough to remember, you know, Lake Erie catching on fire and the, the commercials with the Native Americans standing on the side of a highway and someone threw out a fast food bag and it landed at the, at, you know, at, at, at his feet and then it panned up and he's got the one tear coming down his, you know, down his uh, cheek and everything. So where did these all come about? Count, just start right there. Yeah, you know, it's a great question um, that I, I think it's interesting because there are 
a lot of people who who perceive this as being something that we're we're hearing about a lot, especially since the pandemic. Right. I mean, the, the reality of of how our businesses intersect with our community, we we can't ignore that anymore. We we see it everywhere. But the reality is this has been coming for quite a long time, even since those commercials uh, that you're re you're referencing. There have been business leaders saying, you know, we have a role to play in our communities. Right. And so it just hasn't had a strong framework or terminology. So you hear um, conscious capitalism, you hear stakeholder management, you hear shareholder management, which is kind of the opposite theme of, of ESG, all of these different pieces of the puzzle. But it's been evolving, I would say, since the mid 90s, people have been talking about it, but it's been very quiet. Uh, and so, or at least it hasn't gone mainstream. Okay. So where ESG is really interesting is that it is becoming mainstream because it's it's a framework that investors are looking at. So okay. because there's money behind it saying, we believe that if you're paying attention to ESG, you're managing risk, or right. you're looking for new strategic opportunities, or you have a competitive advantage in some way, because investors are looking at that, CEOs are now paying attention to it, and people are trying to figure out Okay, what do I need to do to take advantage of the capital that's out there now? Okay, so go through and describe the three areas and what is in each area, starting you know with environmental. What what is a company looking at when it comes to environmental, then social, then government? Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of the fun of ESG is that it's very custom to the organization. And when it's done well, it should be relevant to the organization's strategy. So within E, we're looking at environmental concerns such as what's your carbon footprint? Um, how effectively are you creating um, uh, cyclical life cycles, reducing waste, being thoughtful about uh, your pollution, how, how just really what are the negative impacts of your business to the environment and what what are you doing to offset those so esg is or the e in esg is probably in my opinion the most locked down it's the one where we have the clearest guidelines the clearest uh, targets because the government has has established some of those okay so in the e framework it's very it's very clear and SASB, SASB, has some really good guidelines that you can go in and look by industry to see which things are relevant. Because obviously, if you work in a manufacturing company, the environmental component is going to be different than you if you work in a tech company. Right. And so um, you have to be thoughtful about your organization and your industry, and then you set the targets accordingly. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to, well, we'll talk about S next. So then okay. S is... I like to do it last, but S is really about the social component. So how well is your organization investing in your community and your people and your customers? Are you working in the best, in their best interest? Okay, so um, when you say investing, mm -hmm. what, this, give me, give me the definition of investing in that context. Yes. Um, are you making decisions that are in their best interest? Mm -hmm. And are you, are you thinking about the cost benefit analysis of that? Okay. So, um, so a lot of times you'll see organizations that are thinking about benefits, uh, employee wellness, obviously safe working conditions. Those are core requirements. Then they'll start to extend that to think about their customers. How well are they ensuring that they're meeting all the regulatory you know, requirements, that they're meeting all their ethical behaviors. And then, you know, you should see organizations thinking about how well they are engaging with their communities. Do they have volunteer programs? Are they partnering to address community health needs? Um, some of those broader questions say, we recognize that there's a broader uh, impact by engaging with the community that we can address. So let's figure out how we partner on those. Okay. Now, S is my favorite area to talk about. <laughs> it's also the one that is, that's why I like to leave it for last, but it is also the one that is the least loosely defined. So there has been a lot of talk lately about the fact that it doesn't have the same kind of standardized metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to, again, be really un understanding in this case of what your specific local community needs, what your customers are looking for and what their needs are. And then you really have to sort of build that employee focused business. Okay. All right, good. So give okay. us G. 
G. G is all the stuff that we learn that we have to do. So G is looking at the governance of the organization. How well are you thinking about your diversity and bringing a diverse perspective to the board? Are you disclosing everything that you need to be disclosing? Are you considering long-term risks um, and meeting your fiduciary responsibilities as a board? To me, that's really board governance, legal governance. Those are the pieces that come in at G. Okay. okay. All right. And so for each of these, there are standard metrics that my company, no matter what it is, I can go to and say in, you know, to, to be, I, would you say ESG compliant? Is, is that the proper terminology? Uh, I don't know if I <laughs> yeah. I well, yeah, because it's not a rule. It's not a standard right. you have to follow, but what, what, what do you refer to it as? We're yeah. ESG friendly? <laughs> ESG friendly is a good way to put it. Um, okay. So I would consider them guidelines okay. um, because the interesting part is when you look at ESG, there is no one specific organization that says, here's how you do it. SASFI is sort of US-based. You've got GRI, which is global. The World Economic Forum is actually in the process of trying to create these standards. So eventually okay. it will be. But it is still a little bit of a wild west because you could look at Morningstar's sustainability analytics or ESG analytics, and you could look at a BlackRock. They're not necessarily the same. They're very specific to the to the uh, the investigator to the to the investor who's making these decisions and evaluating them. Yeah. So you could look at ten different ESG scores, and they could all have slightly different variations of okay. what. Yes. So, there, so there's no standardized scoring of this. Not sort yet. Of, sort of like the SATs, right? <laughs> Not yet. I, there are probably some tech platforms out there that will take exception to me saying that. Right. Um, but I, I would say that it is not currently standardized okay. enough that you could compare apples to apples. Right. But you have you have big players in this in this industry, so to speak, uh, or in this uh, arena, and yes. people will say, "What's your ESG score?" Yeah, uh, you know, and okay, all right, got it. Okay, I, th I think hopefully our listeners uh, can have that also. Craig, <laughs> so so Dora, I won't take us back to the seventies for examples of of the poor Native American guy in the trash bag. So About seventy two or seventy three, just you know, I I recall it. I'm just not going to go back. <laughs> uh, this was just ten or twelve years ago. So I grew up in the student loan industry, and we can decide if that was a net good or a net bad as a career choice, but we'll set that aside for another podcast. But I remember going out with my boss, who in front, when we get into discussions with customers, said, well, you know, our primary responsibility is to return shareholder value, which was, I mean, I got it, but at the same time, I didn't want to talk to my customers about it. But shareholder value, this was just 10 or 12 years ago, was the ruling metric, right? Shareholder value. So when we're looking at these other things, where does that align or, you know, set aside from shareholder value? How, how, do, how are we looking at this as part of the equation? That's such a good question. And I, I love shareholder value. And actually, that theory, it comes from the 70s. So Milton Freeman wrote an article on shareholder value um, in August of, what was it, August of 76, 76, I think. And said, you know, that business only has has one responsibility and it is to return uh, shareholders their money. Anything else is socialism, right? I mean, it's, and this was the 70s. So this was like, well, I better follow this because God forbid, I don't want to be considered, you know, a socialist in any way. Also, if I'm a CEO and you're telling me all of a sudden all I have to do is manage one thing, well, that's a lot easier. So I'm totally going to get on board with that. Um, and so you're right, that has been the ruling thought um, really up until 2019. And in 2019, the business roundtable came to the table and came to the table and said, hey, is this still our primary responsibility? And they'd ask this question every four years. And the answer was still, yep, that's our responsibility. And then in 2019, they changed their mind. They, they came out with this statement of purpose that recognized that business needs to be operating in the interest of all of their stakeholders. And I so remember from it was shareholders like, to stakeholders, shareholders to stakeholders. So now right. instead of just focusing on the people who have invested in us, right. we are thinking about customers, mm -hmm. employees, communities, partners, really the entire ecosystem of our business. Right. And 
the reality is that those organizations, those individuals were already impacting our business. So it's not like we didn't already have a responsibility. We just didn't have the proof and the momentum to say that we should be doing this. And what we know now is that when organizations are thinking about all of their stakeholders, that they do return better financial investment to the people who have invested in them. So it is not a trade-off. It is not a trade-off. You can, you can take care of your stakeholders. And when you do that, it returns higher values to your shareholders. Okay. And you know, when we talk about some of these things and you know, we've seen, Lou and I have talked a lot about things like we don't really spe specifically speak to conscious capitalism, but around that idea, around employee engagement, around kind of moving from manager as, as boss to manager as coach. Is this all part of that kind of evolution we're seeing in business as kind of the millennial generation is working its way through the corporate ranks? Is that some of what's behind this is kind of just generational change and how we look at business? Well, you do see a lot of stats out there that say that Gen Z and millennials are, are taking, you know, taking, paying more attention, that they're putting bigger stakes in the ground on, on the importance of this. So there is data out there that, that shows that, um, you know, subjectively, in my experience, it's not just millennials and Gen Z, because I know a lot of Gen Xers who wanted this and are still trying to figure out how to do it. And I know a lot of boomers who retired and went and volunteered, you know, so I think that the values of giving back and community, those are intergenerational. But I just think that the younger generations are saying, I don't see why I can't have both. Right. And, and they are pushing us to think differently as leaders. Right. And now right. we've got the people with money saying that we should too. So yeah. We're, yeah. In a, we're in a really unique time. In fact, in fact, when you were talking about that, I was thinking that, you know, the, the, the time was when you went for a job, you looked for salary and benefits. You really didn't. You, we didn't. My generation, you mentioned the, the, the boomer generation. We were just salary and benefits. We didn't care if we were working for an autocratic boss and, you know, what the climate was. If, you know, one company came in at, you know, $40,000 more than another company, I'm going with the $40,000 sure. more company. Where what you say, and the writing has been on the wall generationally, okay, yes, the X, the, uh, the, the X's, uh, the, the Y's and the Z's, that, that, that's become more conscious to them. And particularly more with this Zoomer uh, uh, population coming into the workplace now, where they truly are looking at that social aspect of a company. Am I going to be a fit? This is going to be a place where, you know, it's going to be doing good for the community, for the environment, that environmental. Uh, the government side is usually the, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion side of it. And so they're looking for those things in the company. So my question is, I'm looking for a job. I just graduated from college in May. And where do I find the information that you're talking about right now? That's a good question there. It's actually hiding in plain sight. It's hiding in plain sight. That's that's what my father always used to tell me when I'd say, where are my keys or where's my wallet? And he'd say, it's hiding in plain sight. Okay, so where where are the Zoomers wallets and keys then when it comes to finding a job? Yes, it's hiding in the ESG report, actually. Um, so when I evaluate companies to look and see, are they actually addressing their stakeholders' needs? I start looking, I actually start with the annual reports so okay, i have so read, companies are putting it in their annual reports some of them are right next to profit and loss right well, you will see that in certain annual reports so if you look at what the organization is talking about their mission the kinds of activities that they're looking at long-term risks you can get a sense of sort of how how the company is tracking especially if it's an annual report that has a letter from the ceo right a letter to shareholders that will right. give you a lot of insight so you can start looking at that. Then you go back and you start collecting receipts. So what does the ESG report actually say? What do Glassdoor reviews say? Have there been any OSHA violations or other federal violations that would indicate that what they're saying in this report is actually uh, a load of crap? Can I say that? Is it actually? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you if, if, you, if you use a cuss word, we'll just put a little check mark in the, this <laughs> podcast contains explicit language. So. That's good. That's and you owe a dollar to the curse jar. 
we have a curse chair. Okay, good. I should have I should have actually used a good word then. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah. you look Go at for those. it. <laughs> <laughs> but you look at those and you just basically say, does this organization is it doing what they say they want to do? That's how you evaluate ESG, in my opinion. What matters is actual outcomes, not a really good strategy. Okay. All right. So in prospective employees can use these metrics to determine if this company meets their um, expectations uh, of what they want in the world and where they want to spend eight hours a day, five days a week, if not more, uh, where it, you know, we're working with the community. We've got a good diverse culture here. Uh, we're not killing the environment, all of that stuff. And it's also used from an investment standpoint, which I'm going to get into that. How does this, okay. How does all of this equate to we're making more money? Yeah. Cause if well, I'm spending money, to minimize my carbon footprint, I would see that taking away from potential revenues that sure. I would be able to report as profit. So where are companies making money on this ESG? Well, from the environmental standpoint, it's about, it's about the time frame that you're looking at and how long your time frame for decision making and risk management is. So on the environmental side, um, there's a, an economist from the University of Chicago who said, if you have a 25% a chance of something happening in five years, you know, you're probably not going to invest in that. But if you know that you've got a 95% chance of it happening in 15, then you probably need to take action. And so part of this process is understanding how long are you planning to be in business? Right. Uh, what are, how, how long is the time frame of risk you're willing to assume? And you use that as part of your strategic decision making. Okay. But at, the end, but at the end of the day, when, when we think about the ecosystem, I'll, I'll just put it out the way that I think about it. If you're investing in your employees, you know they're going to come to work and they're going to be more engaged. They're going to stay longer. They're going to do better work and find ways to innovate. And, and they're going to show up to work, right? So you're going to have lower employee costs. If you're thinking about suppliers and doing the right thing for your, diver, your suppliers, that at the end of the day, if there's a pandemic or a major supplier crisis, you're going to have better relationships to innovate. You're going to have better ways to think about the system. HEB, actually the grocer down in Texas is one yeah. of my favorite examples of an organization that's done a lot of work to prepare in that perspective from a yeah. supplier diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, when we think about communities, the more we invest in our communities, the more license to operate we have. We, we will be able to leverage better infrastructure from our communities, we'll have better access to talent, and we won't have to spend time generating goodwill from the community because they don't want us there. You see that you see that like Wegmans out in West Virginia, I think there's a big backlash right now for people who don't want them in their community for a variety of reasons. So they're gonna have to right. spend a lot of time lobbying uh, and creating goodwill with the community to overcome that those objections. So right. they need a stronger license to operate. Yeah, because particularly here, in, I mean, in, in the Midwest, you've got a lot of cities that built up around comp big companies uh, that, uh, you know, they provided employ in, you know, empl employment for all their people. You know, one of my clients in Peoria, I mean, they literally built Peoria and they are the backbone of Peoria and they are very conscious on providing community support by, you know, doing uh, volunteer activities and, and, and they are very involved in the community and that community just embrace Well, <laughs> it embraces the, the employer because right. most of the people are employees. <laughs> so uh, yeah. they, they see, they see the instant effect of the company being very good for the community. That's a great, that's a great example. That's a great example. Uh, and then the last component with how it, how it impacts your business is customer loyalty. So customers pay attention to what our brands are doing. They have access and visibility to information in ways that did not exist right. 12 years ago, like we were talking about. And they care about it, and they're willing to make buying decisions. They're willing to pay more. They're willing to advocate for companies. You know, they are expecting more, and, and, and they will pay for it. So at the end of the day, you invest in ESG. And you are going to increase opportunities for revenue and you are going to decrease your costs. Okay. It's that simple. And it happens in a million different ways. Okay. Um, but it happens. Right. 
How many times have you had to tell the accounting comp side of the business or that argument? Because I can tell there are a lot of accountants going, yeah, that's a lot of HR. The HR comes in and says, this training is going to help us. This coaching is going to help us. This process improvement program is going to help us. And then at the end of the quarter, we're not seeing anything. So let's throw it on the table. Well, it, it, that's a really interesting point because I would say there are two things that you should know for the for the CFOs out there who are thinking this is all this is all crap. I'm gonna use right. Uh, or to, to, to use a word you wanted to use before, it's all bullshit. It's all, <laughs> I know there's somebody out there thinking it, and that's okay. That's yeah. okay because I've done the work to prove that it's not. Right. So I, I can come back and say I will show you the data. I mean, the data is very clear right. um, that it does that it does work, but Back in the day, I used to say, when I can convince a CFO that this is like a really sound investment, I know that I will have it made. Like those were going to be the people that I had to work the most to get on board because I knew they were going to be my biggest skeptics. Right. What actually happened was different. They were the people who were welcoming me in because the CEO was already coming into them and saying, I feel like we should give $50,000 to this charity. Meanwhile, Somebody needs like fancy new chairs for the office. So how are they supposed to offset that decision making? And how do they evaluate whether it's a good investment or not? Right. Um, and so they were already being asked. They just didn't have any tools to make the decisions. Okay. So, um, so you have provided them with criteria that was un, been, un, unbeknownst to them in, in the past. A, a process and a strategy. Right. Yep. A okay. process and a strategy and some guidelines for measurement. So at the end of the year, if it didn't work, they know and they can shift plans. Yeah. All right. So we've been talking about this in terms of big corporations, big businesses, tech firms, right. people with tons of money to decide what they're, how they're going to deploy it. Now let's talk to our small business owners in our audience. I run a small business. I have five, seven, five to $10 million a year in revenue. And I care about these things, but I'm not flush with cash. How do I start implementing these ideas at the small business level? Mm -hmm. There are so many small steps, easy, not cumbersome steps that an organization can take to start thinking about ESG. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in that framework. So if you are looking at E, one of the fastest things that you can do is go take the B Corp assessment. So B Corp is a certification that will help you um, ensure that you're functioning to a certain level. Of, of responsibility. You don't have to get the B Corp certification, but their assessment is really helpful in thinking through some of the strategies that you can take. So it's maybe a 20 minute questionnaire and it walks through everything from water usage to paper recycling. They even start talking about pay and some of the other social things. So that's one thing that a small business could do to evaluate where they're at right now. The second thing that you can start doing is creating a volunteer program. Um, hmm. So thinking about what your employees are looking for, um, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be crazy, right? Give your employees a day, a quarter to volunteer with something that they are passionate about. Mm -hmm. And then think about how that ties into the vision and the values of your organization and talk about it in your annual reviews, right? If yeah. I'm looking for a leadership position and, and the organization doesn't have one that's going to help me grow and maybe I'm going to have to leave, why can't I develop those skills through board service or volunteerism at another organization? Those are ways that small businesses can leverage the community and give back um, in a way that's win-win that's not cash heavy. Got it. Great. Thank you. That, 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 really, that really is good. That, that, I like that. I like that. So be, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate when everything, anytime something is new to me, I've, I've got to always put the, the, you know, well, what about? Yeah. Um, how is all of this, particularly in the day and age in which we're living, how is it not considered a bunch of woke shit? <laughs> uh, I love that question. I know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I got to make, because you're talking environment. So it's climate change. You're talking social, you know, you're talking diversity, equity, and inclusion to me as a, you know, a boomer, that's a bunch of woke stuff these days. Okay, so how do you get over that objection? Because one, I don't agree with that. I, I'm just posing the question to see how you react and answer. Yeah, so um, the so way- go. That, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, that's really, it's, 
It's such a good question. Um, so there is a social entrepreneur that I know uh, out in Kansas City, and he is the one who told me to read well, Capitalism because he does not believe in any of this this woke stuff, right? Like he is, he's anti, he's made decisions in his business about what he will and won't do based off of his political or philosophical beliefs. But he's still a social entrepreneur that is trying to create social impact through his business. So I think it's fascinating. Um, it's not political. It's not political. Well, we um, say that about a lot of things like, uh, I don't know, pandemics. <laughs> that does seem familiar. Yeah. I mean, here's the reality. You can either choose to think that this is something, you can choose to believe that this is something, and you can uh, look at the data and agree with the data, and you can start to take some action to create an opportunity for your business or to max or to minimize risk, right? Those are those are the options you have. Or you can say, I don't believe in any of this. I think it's BS. Don't waste your time because it's not going to feel passionate. It's not going to get you the, it's not going to get you the results that you want. Right. Yep. Um, what, one more note, if I can go ahead. Larry, yeah. <laughs> Larry Fink, Larry Fink, uh, the CEO of BlackRock. I, mean, I don't know how many billions of dollars he's worth. He looks at ESG as a risk management opportunity. Uh, he looks at it. He was in the banking crisis. He looks at ESG as a way to be evaluating all the potential risks, environmental, social governance risks, regulatory risks yeah. that could hit your business. Mm -hmm. He sees it as risk management. I see it as an opportunity. Uh, I see it as a way to be thinking and innovating about things that your business could be doing in the future that's going to help it grow and make more money. Um, so it doesn't really matter what your propensity is. The, the, the math, is, the process is still the same. It's just right. a matter of how you're working the equation. Right. I, I see it as an image booster. I mean, because everything that we're talking about in all three of those areas, if my company's doing it, I'm getting good, I'm getting, you know, great PR in the community. I'm getting it amongst my customers. I'm getting it amongst my employees who are going out and talking to people that they know that, you know, are then beginning to support me because of the things that we're doing. So I, I, I do see, you know, going back on the question I asked you, you know, how does this make profit? I, I can see how it can make profit just strictly a PR way. Sure. Because the, you're talking about things that everybody in the community should be concerned about. There's a laundry list of things here. You don't need to be a single, you know, single issue voter uh, on this one. You've got an entire smorgasbord of different opportunities that a company can do to increase their image within the community and within their business industry. Period. End of story. Craig, <laughs> you're looking at me. <laughs> and Lou just dropped the mic. So I guess we're yeah, Lou just dropped the mic. Yeah, that... <laughs> and with that. So Dora, aside from learning more by reading your book, The Aspirational Business, how can people get in touch with you or follow you uh, to learn more? Yeah, thanks for asking. The best way for people to follow me really is to go to LinkedIn and find me. I'm, I'm LinkedIn slash IN slash Dora Lutz. Uh, I put a lot of videos of whatever I'm seeing or thinking about, uh, a, a lot of publications, notes, articles, blog posts, whatever, resources that are out there. That's the easiest way for people to follow me. They can also go to giving-spring.com. Uh, if they want to, if they want to call and talk about wokeness, you know, hey, I'm up there. I'm up for that. I will, I will pull out my spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> just know what you're getting, but you can go to givingspring.com and, um, and set up a time for a call and, and I will help uh, walk somebody through if they're, if they're struggling with this. Fantastic. All right. Well, at the end, we always like to do our key takeaways. So Lou, what are your key takeaways today? My key takeaways, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, I, I had heard on the fringes about ESG was not really, what is it? Didn't know it didn't fit into finances in my area or management. And so it was just another one of those, what I considered before talking to you, Dora, one of those HR programs that we need to, but I think you've uh, opened my eyes and hopefully, hopefully opened the ears and eyes to our viewers and listeners of this is something that is a lot more than just a bunch of woke stuff. Uh, employees are looking for it as they're making changes, particularly in this great resignation. Uh, we hear people are leaving their jobs because their company just, it, it's not where they want to be. The, the, the culture is not what they want to be. And I think you've got some good guidelines within ESG for any business owner, no matter the size of the company, because the bigger the company, yeah, the bigger the list is good. The checklist is going to be. 
be. The smaller the company, the smaller the checklist is going to be. But it's giving you that opportunity to be a better business. And when you're a better business, you attract customers and you attract money. So that's my key takeaway. All right. Well, well, I have two today. One, I really thought, Lou, I didn't see you going to the, the garbage Native American tier one. I thought you were going to go to Coca-Cola, teach the whole world to sing. So there were always full surprises for me, Lou. That was, that was about the same time. I know. I was there, Lou. I was just yeah. a good bit younger. At any rate, the other one is, and this is something I even saw in my last business, is looking at your business about something more. And the, the larger impact when you can start to see what the impact is on your community, on the team, and how you can help people grow, and how you can help your community. And that, I think, is really the key to this is it's about wanting to be something more than just a business that people show up for, for you know, eight to five every day. And it's really about the larger impact you can make. So that was my key takeaway. Dora, how about you? What was your key takeaway today? Uh, well, I have two, actually, also. I think uh, there is a smorgasbord of opportunity is my favorite line uh, from this entire <laughs> week. So I, I I, might actually just go change my LinkedIn profile right now to say that, because I think that's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but also, I really appreciated the hard questions. You know, I think I think the question about wokeness, I think the question about how does this fit into finance, I, those are what people are struggling with, and and they're not always willing to ask. And so I really appreciated that you were willing to ask those. Um, that that meant a lot to me. Well, we warned you in the green room conversation that you know we were just Mike Wallace and Morley Safer, you know, just reincarnated. I mean, no <laughs> doubt, you guys definitely brought leadership. out the hard ones. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, Dora, thanks so much for being here, and uh, thanks for being part of Q and A Breakthrough Leadership. Fabulous. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Well, Craig, again, not a disappointment. And I think as we set everything up at the very beginning, we said this was going to be a podcast where we're going to learn. And as you and I both admitted, we didn't know a lot about ESG prior to talking to Dora, but uh, she, well, I, I, I hope we gave her some good questions uh, that uh, some of our viewers and listeners may have been thinking about as they were listening to this podcast as well. Uh, but she had some great answers. Oh, yeah. She's a great speaker. If you get a chance after you watch, now that you've watched this episode in full, she has a great TED Talk out there, too. So, yeah, this was great. Learned a lot. And uh, we'll, maybe we'll bring her back since we're now moving into our repeat interview phase of the podcast. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dora Lutz when we talked about ESG. And if you liked it, please go ahead and provide us uh, some comments. Uh, give us a rating. Give us a five-star rating so that other people can find out about us. Share it also. Review us. Uh, we are available on many of your social networks, such as LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And in addition to that, we are located every week on Thursday on Spotify, Apple, or whatever your favorite podcast platform happens to be. So until next time, be the best leader you can be. I'm Lou Quinto. And I'm Craig Anderson.